Could your IoT lighting device lead to a Rickroll? Stay tuned. Secure Ninja. So we found a quiet room here at DEF CON, and I'm able to sit down with Daryl Highland. He is the research lead of IoT at Rapid7. How are you, Daryl? I'm doing good. How are you? Excellent. I'm doing well. Glad to sit down with you because I understand you've done some recent research on lighting automation, and you've got some vulnerabilities that you've found that you're going to show us. Uh, yes, uh, we just did some research over the last several months uh, on uh, dealing with uh, Osram Sylvania lighting systems, the, the home system, the enterprise system, and we found uh, nine uh, disclosures, and we're going to discuss some of those disclosures here with you. Awesome. That'll be fun to see. Okay. Yeah, kind of, uh, kind of why, uh, one of the things I like to cover is, you know, why do we look at the lighting systems? Often, lighting systems aren't considered a, a real risk in most organizations. I mean, as an example, I mean, this gives us a different perspective of lighting. This actually came out of a light bulb. So, so, so uh, for automated lighting, now we're looking at, it's not just a light bulb, it's a real technology that can be manipulated in some cases and, and cause security issues. So during, during this research, at Rapid7, these nine vulnerabilities we found, we kind of looked at the home system and enterprise system with the goal of identifying risks that may impact organizations, enterprise organizations, besides customers. So we looked at the home system first, identified those, and then we wanted to look to see what those issues moved over into the enterprise level. Because typically, we have a saturation of IoT technology. It exists in nearly all homes now. And since we've met that saturation, now we're also seeing this, this growth of IoT in the enterprise or business organizations. And, and the goal for the research is to give insight uh, into those risk and issues for consumers and customers of Rapid7. So that's why we did the research. The vulnerabilities we typically found here, some of them were pretty minor. I think uh, probably the minor ones was what we refer to as SSL pinning. Um, the devices are mobile apps also. So when we're looking at this technology, it, it integrates with mobile technology also. So you got mobile apps that control these devices through the cloud. So we look at the mobile applications also. And, and in this case, the SSL pinning, when this connected to the cloud, it wasn't uh, locking it into the actual SSL or HTTPS connectivity. So it makes it possible for a hacker to get in between the devices and do a man in the middle. So that was kind of the low end. On the high end of the vulnerabilities, we discovered that the, the actual Wi-Fi pre-shared keys that were used on the enterprise level had such a small key space that an attacker could crack those keys and gain access. And since this device actually lives on the network for Ethernet and Wi-Fi, it becomes an access point. So if they crack those passwords, they're into your corporate network. Pretty straightforward. Some of the other interesting vulnerabilities we found during the research at Rapid7 was uh, these devices have web interfaces on them that are managed. And those web interfaces can have the same vulnerabilities you see on the internet-based web stuff. And so it's no different. Even though it exists on this device, an attacker could carry out various attacks, maybe you know, like SQL injection and cross-site scripting. Our case, we actually found a couple cross-site scripting vulnerabilities that existed in this product that uh, an attacker could leverage, and that was kind of the high end of that. I can show you a quick video if you want to see it uh, that actually shows uh, this particular attack. So uh, in this particular video, we're actually going to log on to the management console of this particular device right here. And in that management console, there's a configuration page that allows for configuring the Wi-Fi functionality. And I'll stop it here when we get to a certain point. Uh, so when you go to configure that, you can see all the other SSIDs or all the other wireless access points that actually exist in close proximity. And it, in this case here on that particular page, you could actually inject cross-site scripting using a wireless access point, an external one. So that's what we're getting ready to do here. I'll go ahead and start this back up. In this case here, we start up an actual uh, soft AP, and we're going to inject into it a flash file. So we're going to actually put a call for a HTML call for a flash file into the SSID name. So when the uh, user, administrator, who's logged on this device, actually tries to go to that configuration page, what we do is we end up 
getting, uh, in this case, a rickroll. So it's kind of an entertaining uh, version of the attack. The big thing with the risk is, in, in this case, obviously entertaining, but in reality, an attacker could put code in there, making it possible for to take over the administrator's machine. The administrators are often logged onto this device with administrative access. They often have administrative access to their machine. And in some cases, they may have elevator right or administrative access on the corporate network. And in that case, if I can take over or attack their machine, a malicious actor could gain access to the corporate network. Right. So it makes for a very serious uh, flaw. In that case. And those were the, the kind of the low end and the high end. One of the other things I always like to make a point of is the, the protocols. These devices, when they connect to the light bulbs, they do it with a, a protocol known as Zigbee. And it's in this case, Zigbee Home Automation Protocol. The Zigbee Home Automation Protocol is completely flawed, it's completely broken. Uh, Zigbee does an encryption uh, between the machine and the, the uh, in this case, the light bulb. It does an encryption, but the key for the home automation is known. And it's out on the internet. So anyone can decode or decrypt. And these things also do not rekey. Uh, that communication so an attacker can do replay attacks or capture the data and decode it and do tax that way and that's that's probably not such a big risk when we're dealing with home users home users you know I guess your neighbor could like turn your lights on or off or something like that so it's a little bit of harassing type thing but in the enterprise level these devices are controlling maybe office buildings could be this technology could be used in hospitals it could be used in you know uh, retail outlets Turning the lights off in those locations is, is a big impact. So those are really a, a serious security issue. And it turns out in this case that that same protocol, automation protocol, which doesn't rekey, was being used. Uh, on a positive note, uh, I work closely with Sylvania and Osram on this. Uh, they've gone through and fixed all the most critical ones, which is key. And another thing I like to point out, which is what we want to see with all IoT technology, we know there's going to be vulnerabilities found in IoT technology. That's never, ever going to change. But we want to have the ability to patch those. And in this case here, Sylvania and Osram did a great job with their patching mechanism. So as an example on the whole one, anytime I start up my mobile app, it'll actually go out and verify uh, the actual patch levels and if there's any new patches. And it'll actually force me to upgrade all my devices and my light bulbs to the great latest firmware. So when we worked with them to solve this issue, they were able to quickly fix those and roll that issues out to their consumers fixing these problems very quickly so which is a real positive yeah that's great that they took the initiative to you know be receptive to your research and make the proper changes oh yes very much so uh, and uh, so it, it, this is pretty much the the issues that we found uh, we worked with the vendor uh, it was a lot of fun the project was a lot of fun and the most the most interesting thing is coming out of this as we do this in at rapid seven for all of our research going forward it gives us the ability to one help the consumer help the manufacturers we can help the uh, people that actually use this in the enterprises we can help them secure that so we, we grow a wealth of knowledge uh, within our organization to give that kind of insight into the community the customers and uh, the manufacturers where do you see um, IoT going in the future as far as security? Do you think these products are going to be made more secure as, as, as they're, you know, the vulnerabilities are being discovered, or do you think they'll continue to just make them not so secure and then you know, fix them later? I, uh, yeah, you know, that's kind of a sad thing. The, the issue is, is a lot of these companies have never really dealt with IoT. An example, they're a lighting company. Uh, nothing against them, but I mean, you can go to a lot of different manufacturers. So now they're producing IoT technology, which involves software and code and, and all this stuff that they've never really had to deal with before. So it's kind of new with them uh, getting a good understanding. In, in case with them, they, they have a fairly uh, good security program. But of course, their products had flaws too. We see a lot of startup companies that really have no resources, no abilities. Uh, in the area of security. So we're going to see that. But I think moving forward in the future, as we report these things, we work with the manufacturers to solve these problems, and we produce an awareness 
that hopefully will bring down that number of vulnerabilities. But if we can also get every manufacturer to really start thinking about the patching cycle. I mean, this is what has helped save us with all the other software problems we have over the years. Most of the manufacturers of all the software we use every day have got to the point where they have solid patching programs. And that's made a difference. The vulnerabilities haven't gone away, but we're quickly resolving them because we can find them and fix them quickly. And I think that's very important. Definitely. Well, thanks for sharing this research with us. Thank you. We always love to hear what you guys are doing at Rapid7. You're always uncovering interesting stuff. So thank you very much for showing us. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching. We hope you've enjoyed this episode from DEF CON 24. Do us a favor, leave us a comment below, and let us know what you thought of this episode. Also, what other type of content would you like to see from these shows? Let us know if you were at DEF CON as well. We'd love to hear from our fans. If you haven't yet subscribed to Secure Ninja TV, click the red button below and join us so you don't miss a thing. I'm Alicia Webb, and I will see you in the next video. Bye!